Only the spirit of attack born in a brave heart will bring success to any fighter aircraft, no matter how highly developed the aircraft may be. That quote from a German fighter ace in World War II was the motto of our squadron in Alaska. I'm Bruce Gordon. It was 1963. Tony Melly and I were flying in Alaska, and this story is how he demonstrated the spirit of attack, but pushed his F-102 so far beyond its limits that he nearly lost his life. Tony survived his F-102 experience and went on to fly over 100 combat missions in Vietnam in the F-4. Our home base was at Elmendorf, and we had forward bases at King Salmon, Galena, and Isleson. From Isleson, we could fly north of the Brooks Range and cover all the way to the Arctic Ocean. Our F-102 was an excellent interceptor. It had excellent radar, long range, but it had difficulty with targets over 40,000 feet. But that was sort of okay because few airplanes could fly above 40,000 feet except the U-2. It was January 1963. We were having a sky shield exercise where SAC bombers were flying over the Arctic ice pack and attacking from the north. And we fighters were defending American airspace and trying to get the SAC bombers. Tony Melly had just nailed a B-52, and he was feeling pretty good. Then his controller called with an unexpected target. A U-2 was returning from an unknown mission at a very high altitude across the Arctic ice pack. Did Tony have the fuel remaining to make the attack? Tony had the fuel, and he was ready to go. Tony turned his F-102 on the attack vector and accelerated at about 35,000 feet. The books say that the F-102 could go supersonic to about Mach 1.25, but in reality, we didn't quite get there. Tony got out to about 0.95 at 35,000 feet, and he was flying a level attack because he was on a snap-up type attack. When your target is much higher than you are, you come in low, accelerating, and then when the computer tells you, you pull up and snap up and fire your weapon while you're going almost straight up. Then you recover and let your missiles go the rest of the way up to the target. This was a snap-up attack, and Tony was going to do that. Let's see how it looked on his scope. Okay, the target's about 10 miles away. Tony's turning left. The target is high. Got about 450 knot overtake. Uh, maybe you want to look at the scope in more detail. Now, all the items on the scope are identified, but it's still too complex. Let me take each one of them in turn. The light vertical band, about 30 degrees left, is called the jizzle band. That is the actual radar return that we saw. It is a vertical band, rather than you might think a pie shape would have been better for the radar in front of a fighter, but this display actually was very helpful, and with just a little bit of practice, it was the best possible scope for us to use. The target shows in there as a white marker at about 10 miles away on this 30 mile scope. The sloping line is the artificial horizon, just as the horizon would look to you if you could see it. And it shows that Tony is banking about 15 degrees to the left 
and is climbing slightly. His nose is slightly above the horizon. The radar antenna elevation marker on the right side of the scope shows that the target is above you. It's not an accurate measurement, but rather an indication that he is definitely above you. The steering dot shows that Tony should turn, pull up, and go a little bit to the left to bring the dot down into the exact center of the scope. The 30 at the top right of the scope shows that he has selected a 30 mile scope. He could have selected several different scope ranges depending on the tactical situation. The gap in the outer circle shows his overtake on the target. That doesn't mean his speed, but his angular overtake on the target. The circle itself starts fairly large and starts to collapse at 15 seconds to go and closes down to a big X at fire time. Okay, put them all together and you can see that the target is about 10 miles away. It's high. Tony is pulling up and to the left to center the dot. Okay, this is what Tony would have seen on his attack. The target is about 18 miles away. He's closing at about 500 knots. The target, the target is very high, but Tony has centered the dot. He's accelerating in full afterburner, right f uh, level with the horizon. The target is eight miles away, about 10 seconds to go before fire. The dot jumps to the top of the scope. Time for Tony to pull up and center the dot and squeeze the trigger to get an automatic fire. Tony has pulled the plane almost straight up. The artificial horizon is caged at the bottom of the scope. It won't go any lower than that. The overtake is down to 100 knots. He's got about five seconds to go before fire. His tailpipe temperature is rising. He keeps the dot centered. He's going to get that kill or he's going to burn out his engine. The big X, the fire signal. The door is open. The missiles fire. Now Tony has made his kill. He has to recover the plane from this very nose high attitude with his engine over temping. Tony gets a brief look at his U2 target, but he's going nearly straight up, has zero airspeed, and he's in trouble. Tony had got his kill, but he had stretched his plane beyond its limits, and now he was in a very dangerous situation. He had made the snap up, and as he came to the top of the snap up and fired his simulated missiles, the airflow through his intakes was reduced as he was going more slowly and in a very nose-high attitude. Now his plane started to back down. The tailpipe temperature of the fuel burning in his tailpipe, his afterburner, was pushing his temperatures through the roof. His engine was going to melt down. He stopped cocked his engine, shut off his engine to keep the engine from melting down. Now he was in a nose-high attitude and he's starting to back down through the air. The airflow through his engine reversed Fuel vapor came out of his intakes and swirled around his cockpit as his plane fell, now with engine out, and he somehow was getting the nose down. Are you okay down there? called the U-2 pilot. Stand by, said Tony, as he struggled to get his plane under control. Somehow, Tony got his nose pointed down so that the airflow through his engine would return to normal. As he did that, he deployed his ram air turbine, a little windmill out there that gave him hydraulic pressure to run his flight controls. As he's coming down, his tail tailpipe temperature, which was pegged at about 1,000 degrees, was coming on down. He was, could now start his engine. He'd better start his engine because he was coming down toward the Arctic ice pack. If Tony couldn't get his engine started, he would have to bail out over the Arctic ice pack and his chances of survival were 
very, very low. We didn't even have helicopters at that time up at Point Barrow to get him. Getting him out of the ice pack would have taken weeks. There was no chance for Tony except to start his engine. As the air flow through his engine resumed and the temperature came down, he started his engine again with the regular way that you do that, and by golly, the engine started. I'm okay now, he called up to the U-2, and then he turned and headed home. Everything looked good for him. He declared an emergency and headed toward Isleson Air Force Base, but everything seemed normal to him. He landed, taxied in, got in the chocks, everything was okay, opened his canopy, and shut down his engine as normal. Screech! The engine came to a sudden stop, frozen in place. That engine never turned again. The bearings were melted. The whole thing was a terrible shape. Tony was called in front of the squadron commander to explain what happened and how he had ruined a perfectly good engine. But Tony had got the kill on the U-2. He had shown the spirit of attack.